started on time and I know people are going to be walking in a little bit later but I want to make sure first of all my deepest apologies for hosting on Super Bowl Sunday um, <laughs> that's Christian's fault he didn't tell us he's the only culturally sensitive one in the group and he, he, didn't, he didn't think about it <laughs> um, I will but, be leaving in 20 minutes to go <laughs> But we, uh, in, in uh, compensation, we will have fried chicken and broadcasting the Super Bowl for anybody who wants to stay and stopping in time for those who want to make it home by kickoff or wherever else that they need to go. Um, so thank you all for being here with us. And I also would like to thank our community co-sponsors, uh, which include the Episcopal Diocese of Washington, D.C. and Reverend Carol Flett. I saw Carol earlier. There she is. Thank you, Carol. Um, and the congregation's B'nai Shalom. I don't believe Rabbi, uh, Rabbi uh, Sunshine's here, but uh, the congregation of Kerala Shalom, Rabbi Charles in the back, thank you. And Family Services Inc., one of our um, great social service providers here in Montgomery County. I don't know if we have a representative from FSI here right now. Um, and also I wanted to thank Lori Edberg from Senator Mikulski's office who joined us here today. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with WORD, um, we go by that acronym. It actually stands for the World Organization for Resource Development and Education. And we're a nonprofit educational organization dedicated to understanding and reducing conflict between diverse communities. This event today is part of our County Executive's Faith Community Working Group. And my teammate, uh, Reverend Caseman, is here somewhere too. So where there he is, thanks Casey. <laughs> and one of, our, one of our goals is bringing together um, county government officials with the faith community and our social service providers. And one of the things we focus on is increasing the citizen's role in public safety. And so with over 3,000 individuals being recruited and over 900 open investigations against homegrown violent extremists, Radicalization of young adults is one of the most serious public safety threats we face in this country. And there are various ways in which research and, and academics in the media describe the scope of the threat of violent extremism. And it ranges from our right-wing militia groups or lone wolf shooters, um, and then it stretches all the way across, of course, to those that are motivated by deviant interpretations of Islam, anywhere from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram. And so, although more than half of the deaths of, from terrorism in the United States have occurred at the hands of non-Muslim terrorists, the national and international focus is on groups like ISIS. And the consequences of each terrorist attack are not measured just by the number of deaths. It also has severe repercussions on our country economically and on the social cohesion of our communities. Just think about the rise of xenophobic attacks against Muslims especially in the recent months. It is also important to note, that those of you that may not have read the recent report from GW, from George Washington Center on Extremism, 42% of those arrested for ISIS-related crimes are converts. So that means they grew up in a house that did not practice Islam. And what that tells us is that there's no family that's immune from the radicalization threat. And therefore, the solution must lie in an aware and an engaged citizenry who can intervene, hopefully, in the lives of vulnerable individuals before they choose a life of crime or violence. Your dedication to learning about what motivates individuals to join such groups and the resources we have to intervene, especially on Super Bowl Sunday, gives me hope that together we're building a safer and more resilient community. Our guest speakers today, Christian Picciolini and Mubin Sheikh, which will share their personal stories of how they were influenced personally by different violent extremist movements, and what are the warning signs to look for someone you know may be radicalizing, and then most importantly, the avenues you have to intervene. The director of our Crossroads program, Nuf Bazaz, will then discuss how counseling and social services can help vulnerable individuals, and especially the resources we have in this county. You have their complete bios on your tables and your handout materials. After their presentation, we'll open the floor to discussion, and so I ask that you please uh, hold your questions until the end. And a few housekeeping notes, if for those of you on social media, we're using the hashtag um, U, as in the letter U, can intervene, 
or MOCO model, M-O-C-O, M-O-D-E-L. And there are evaluation forms on your seats as well, and they really help us to improve our programming, so we really welcome your feedback. And without further ado, um, who would like to start? Ruben or Christian? I guess I'll go first. You go first, <laughs> great. Point toss at this <laughs> or like the Bernie Sanders Hillary. <laughs> would you like to stand? Oh. I'll stand. Great. Please welcome Christian Gilly. I was told how to do this, and I think I figured it out. Yeah. First, I want to say thank you so much for coming today. I know it's an important day uh, for most Americans, and uh, I'm sure you guys would love to be watching football very shortly, so I will make sure to make it interesting and, and uh, encourage my friend Mubin to also make it interesting, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure he will. Uh, my journey started uh, 20 years ago um, when I left the American white supremacist skinhead movement that I helped found. It was 1995, and I was 22 years old at the time. And I'd already spent seven years uh, as part of a movement that taught me how to hate, and in turn where I taught other people how to hate. I was 14 years old at the time, uh, and unlike most people who join uh, most right-wing extremist groups or gangs, uh, I didn't come from a broken home. I actually came from a very solid, Italian-American family who emigrated to the United States uh, in the mid-1960s. Uh, so my life prior to 14 years old when uh, I was first recruited to the white supremacist skinhead movement, I had a pretty normal childhood. I played with Legos, uh, I had girlfriends, I drew Snoopy pictures in the closet. This was literally weeks before I became an extremist. Um, and it kind of changed for me because I grew up in an Italian neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Uh, and most of the families who would come over uh, to the United States uh, and landed in Blue Island, which was the name of the town, came from the same uh, village in Italy. So there was a really strong sense of unity uh, within the community. However, like I said, um, because there was this pride, uh, the Italian families tended to stick together. So when my parents moved, uh, when I started school to a different neighborhood, I lost that sense of community. They moved us to a town called Oak Forest, which was about 20 miles away from where my family had lived for uh, since the 60s, and uh, where we had developed a sense of community. And when we moved to this white neighborhood where there were no Italians, uh, I was suddenly left in the middle of two very different cultures. Uh, I had left one Italian culture where I had uh, some friends, and I moved to a white culture where I didn't have any friends. Um, and now the outside, now the people from the town that I came from saw me as an outsider, and the people who I had just joined, this new school that I had started to go to, saw me as an outsider. So I didn't fit in anymore with my Italian community, and I didn't fit in with this new community. So I kind of was in limbo for many years. And because I was in limbo, and because I was the foreign kid at the school, I was often picked on, and I was bullied really small back then uh, and um, you know kids can be very very cruel so I never quite fit in to any community and I didn't have a lot of friends I, unlike most teenagers I felt disenfranchised and disaffected uh, I felt alienated I was bullied and I was picked on and when at 14 years old I was standing in an alley smoking a joint and contemplating what my life meant, because I didn't know what my life meant. I didn't have an identity. Like a scene out of a movie, a 1969 firebird comes roaring down the alley, and it's spitting up gravel and rocks and dust, and it screeches to a halt and skids two feet from me. And out of the passenger door of this car comes a guy with a shaved head and with tall boots, and he makes a beeline towards me, and he grabs the joint out of my mouth, and he looks me in the eyes, and he says, don't you know that that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile? I was 14 years old. It was 1987. I didn't really know what a communist was outside of, you know, the Rocky movies. <laughs> didn't really know if I had met a Jewish person at that point. I wouldn't have known one if I'd seen one. And I hardly knew what the word docile meant. Like I said, Weeks before this, 
I was sitting in a closet drawing pictures of Peanuts characters and had no intention of ever wandering my mind into politics, and certainly not extreme politics. But when this person came up to me at 14 years old, although it scared me, it also showed me and made me feel that I wanted to be like this person. Because for the first time in my life, an adult told me not to do something for a reason other than you shouldn't do it because it's stupid, you shouldn't do it because it's not good for you. He gave me a reason that made me feel like my life was in danger and so was the life of all the people that I cared about if I was to continue down this path. So like any savvy recruiter, he played on my feelings and he made me feel like I belonged and he promised me the world, he promised me paradise. So the neighborhood that I was living in was pretty culturally diverse. Outside of our small pocket of Italian families, uh, on one side we had Latino families, on another side of the neighborhood we had black families, uh, and uh, on the Upper West Side there were uh, well-to-do white families. And things were changing pretty quickly. So when two weeks after I met this person, this individual who recruited me, who was 26 years old when I was 14, my bike was stolen. I was beaten up by three black kids coming back from a baseball game, and I was beaten up. And all the things that he had started to tell me started to make sense now, even though they never made sense to me before. He would tell me things like, blacks are going to come into your town, and they're going to increase crime. Well, this was evidence of that. I hadn't seen it before, but this was certainly evidence. Latinos were going to come into your town and start dealing drugs and raping your sister. And although I didn't see that, I heard stories of that. And it all started to make sense to me. At 14 years old, I started to feel this sense of pride that I felt for my neighborhood and for my community kind of become dangerous. And I wanted to protect it. I wanted to, at all costs, protect my family from it. Because I was promised that if I didn't, that white genocide was going to happen, that my people were in danger. And this sense of power that I got when I started to hang around with these guys erased all the bullying and all the fear and all the self-doubt that I had prior to that point. Because now the people who picked on me would cross the street when I was walking down the street. And they would walk on the other side and they wouldn't look at me anymore. And suddenly I started to earn favor in the neighborhood. And I started to feel very powerful. Now, it, it was a misguided power because I certainly wasn't powerful at 14 years old. But people were afraid of me. And that fear made me feel strong. A couple months later, my recruiter, Clark Martell, who happened to be the first American neo-Nazi skinhead leader, and I didn't know this at the time, this was the first American neo-Nazi skinhead gang that I had joined right across the alley from my home. So being a part of an infamous group like this also had a sense of power that came along with it. Because I was developing an identity. At 14 years old, I was breaking away from my parents, I was breaking away from my classmates, and I was finally becoming who I was meant to be or who I thought I was meant to be. A couple months later, when uh, Clark Martell was arrested, uh, the guy who recruited me, he was arrested for a series of violent hate crimes. Um, on the 49th anniversary of Kristallnacht, when uh, German soldiers went to Jewish stores and um, broke windows and started to confiscate goods, um, the Chicago skinheads did the same thing on the 49th anniversary. That same week, they also entered uh, a female friend's apartment who was also a skinhead, but they had seen her hanging around with a black guy. They went into her apartment and they beat her to an inch of her life, and they pistol whipped her, and they painted a swastika on the wall with her own blood. And um, although she didn't die, they went to prison, uh, and for 10 years, Clark went to prison. And suddenly, at 15 years old, there was a void left in this organization this very infamous organization that now had started to sprout other groups across the United States. 
but the epicenter was always in Chicago. And at 15 years old, there was suddenly a leadership void that I stepped into, because at that point, I had already started to recruit people. I had been taught how to recruit people. And the people that I had recruited had started to look at me as their leader, because there wasn't one anymore. And for a 15-year-old kid, that's a pretty powerful thing when you have 16 and 17 and 18 year old people looking up to you for direction. So we ramped up our recruiting efforts and I decided at that point that the best way to target white youth was through music. So in 1990, I started one of America's first white power bands. The band was called White American Youth. The acronym was WAY, <coughs> W-A-Y, because I was going to show white kids the way out of their slumber to protect their race from genocide. With that kind of power and with a new record deal from a record label in Germany, I started to get regional attention and national attention and international attention. And in 92, I traveled to Germany and I was in the first band, the first American white power band to ever play in a foreign country. And that was to 4,000 people from all over Europe, neo-Nazi skinheads, racists of every ill, who traveled hundreds and thousands of miles to come to a concert where it was my goal to incite them to violence. Because you see, music for our subculture was the most powerful recruiting tool because not only was it music, it was propaganda. It was education. <coughs> Bands sang about white people being out of jobs that were being taken over by being taken over by blacks. They talked about crime, and they talked about history, and they instilled a sense of false pride. Now, I can't wash my hands of that because I was a part of that. I recorded music that planted seeds for. I don't know how many tens of thousands of people. During that period, both of my bands sold upwards of 15,000 records each. This was before the internet. So all those people who received my music, not to mention the dozens of bands that popped up after mine that were singing about the same thing, it started to really gel this underground resistance of white supremacist youth. And Music has a powerful influence, not just white power music, but it, any kind of music has an influence. It influences kids on how they dress, on how they speak, on who they hang around with. And I recognized that very, very early, because I knew that the white kids in my neighborhood were probably going through the same type of confusion that I was. And it was up to me to identify that confusion and to offer false solutions for it. Just like I was promised paradise by Clark Martell when I was 14 years old, for seven years I promised paradise to people if they were to join our movement. The music that I wrote was meant to incite violence. It was meant to be used by people to commit criminal acts. And it was also meant to recruit more people. So, when this music came out, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. Suddenly, this movement had motion. And we started to see groups pop up all over the country and all over the world. And I've merged our organization with uh, an organization that had just started called the Northern Hammer Skinheads. And the Hammer Skin Nation uh, grew to become the most violent neo-Nazi skinhead group in the world. And for a while I was the, the regional director of it for the northern states where I was in charge of hundreds of people who were out committing criminal acts and recruiting other people. Now, because my parents were immigrants who came to the United States in the mid-1960s from Italy, and they were often the victims of prejudice when they came to this country, I wasn't raised a racist. In fact, it was the opposite. My parents taught me compassion, and they taught me 
how to practice empathy. But because when my parents came here, they were trying to support their family, their young family, and get their slice of the American pie, they got their wires crossed and they thought that they could do that by working all the time. Now, at that time, I missed my parents and I resented them for not being there. Now, of course, I look back and I, and I you know, consider my parents heroes because they came to this country with nothing and they made something of themselves and I don't hold that against them. But if there are any parents in the room with young children, I would urge you, it's so important to foster compassion and empathy in your children at a young age and to keep that going and to treat your children like human beings and not just like subservient children. Because if I had purpose, other than being this lost young kid who was searching for an identity in misguided ways and in the wrong places, perhaps my life could have been different. I always joke about it. Had a group of ballerinas been across the alley, I may have been one of the greatest ballet dancers on earth. <laughs> Don't picture me in a tutu, please. Unfortunately, what I was taught allowed me to become one of the most hateful people on earth. Now, as far as recruitment goes, what, was, what they looked for in me was some of the same things that I looked for in other young people. We looked for kids who felt marginalized who were already parts of sub, you know, subculture groups. So we looked for kids who were into skateboarding, or kids who were into punk music, or kids who were into drugs and were living on the street, because we knew that it wouldn't take much to, to promise them something better than they had. So we would stand outside of concerts, and we would hand out flyers, and initially they were really benign. Like, things like, are you tired of the crime in your neighborhood? Are you tired of not having a voice? Has your family member lost a job? And then we would bring them in. And then the music would come. And then the beer would come. And then the girls would come. And suddenly, these young people, before they even knew they were being radicalized or being politicized, had structure that was hard to leave behind. Then we would introduce the politics. Essentially, and I can say this because I know it's true, we were teaching people to hate somebody more than they hated themselves. Because at that point in my life, I hated myself. I hated the fact that I was bullied. And I hated the fact that I didn't have a voice. And I hated the fact that my parents weren't around when I needed them. And I hated the fact that I was this marginalized kid. So when I found somebody to hate more than I hated myself, felt natural. Because in this movement, in this racist movement, it's never about accepting the blame. It's always about pointing the finger somewhere else. So when something was happening in our neighborhood, we never looked at what we were doing wrong, and the crime, and the violence. We always pointed the finger at somebody else. And when we really took a look at the situation, now I can look at it and realize that the problems we were having were coming from us. We were the ones creating the problem. We were creating division. We were creating hatred. In 1994, I took it one step further and I opened a record store on the south side of Chicago called Chaos Records with the specific intent to sell white power music that I was now importing in from overseas. And this was before the internet. So people would drive in all over the, from all over the country to buy this music. And it became 75% of my gross revenue at my store. But what also happened was because I wanted to be a good business person, because I took a cue from my parents, I also started to sell other music. I started to sell hip hop and punk rock and heavy metal. And suddenly I started to meet people that I had alienated from my circle for seven years. I started to have my first dialogue with African Americans and with same-sex couples and with Jewish people. And what I realized, although at first I bit my tongue and I was a little standoffish, what I started to realize 
was that I had much more in common with them than I did with this family, this false family that I had built for seven years. Because of the compassion, because of the empathy that other people showed me when I least deserved it, it served as a catalyst for me to start to change my views because I hated what I didn't know, what I didn't understand. You see, fear stems from ignorance. If we know something, it's hard to hate because we understand it. We empathize with it. If we keep our distance from it, and it's that other thing, or that other person, and we don't humanize it, it's easy to hate because it's not real. So for seven years, I spent my life living in a bubble where the only things that were real to me were these people that I had surrounded myself with. And everybody else, every other outsider of different color, of different religion, of different race or ethnicity, they were the enemy. Same year, <coughs> my wife and I gave birth to our first son. I got married at 19 years old and had my first child at 19 and a half. And I'll say this to the parents in the room, I'm sure there are a lot with young children, and it sounds cliche to say it, but when you hold your child for the first time, it's magic. It really was a magical experience for me because I was able to connect for the first time with my own innocence that I had lost at 14 years old. I was able to reconnect with my own humanity because now I really had something to love, something tangible that I cared about, that I wanted to make sure had a good life. And although everything about the white power movement was this mantra, this thing we call the 14 words, we must protect the existence of our people and a future for white children, <coughs> suddenly I didn't want my child involved in what I was involved in. So it began to change my life. In 1996, I finally left the movement. And for the last three years of those, of the time I was in the movement, I had what I call in my book, these moments of clarity, these moments of compassion and empathy that never allowed me to really cross over the line to go to prison or to commit an act violent enough to, to damage somebody for life. although I was damaging myself. After I left the movement in 96, thanks to my children and to the people who showed me compassion and allowed me an opportunity to change my heart, I went through a depression for five years where I contemplated taking my life. And I got into drugs and alcohol because I suddenly didn't know who I was. I had lost everything. I lost my wife and children who left me because I hadn't left the movement quickly enough. I lost my job because I decided to close the record store when I pulled the white power music from the shelf. Sales tanked because I was embarrassed to sell it. I had to shut down my store. I didn't have a really great relationship with my parents anymore. And I didn't have the structure that I built for seven years. I didn't have that family around me. So for five years, I had to really learn myself. And one day when a friend of mine told me about a job at IBM, and I said, I don't know anything about technology. This was before Google and the internet, and you know, everybody can use it now. But I applied for the job, and I lied on my resume, and I got the job. <laughs> I stayed there for seven years, too. And on the first day of my job at IBM, all the millions of places that literally IBM could have placed me, they put me at my old high school for a computer rollout. The same high school that I had gotten kicked out of twice and had a restraining order. <laughs> I can laugh about that now. Sorry. But what happened was another magical experience. On that first day, I saw the old black security guard who I'd gotten in a fist fight with that I'd gotten kicked out of school for that second time. And I didn't know what to do. I was terrified. I thought, they're going to know who I am, they're going to tell my boss, I'm going to get fired, I'm going to lose the only job that you know, 
mattered. So I decided that I had no choice but to run after him. And when I saw him in the parking lot, I tapped him on the shoulder. The normal jolly smile that this old man had turned into a scowl when he looked at me and he recognized who I was. And I told him, simply, I'm sorry. And we talked, and we shook hands, and we cried, and it felt like the heavens opened up and surrounded us with this warm, redemptive light. And he made me promise that I would tell my story to everybody. And I've been doing that for now, for 20 years, telling my story. Um, the things that really got me out were the compassion and the empathy that I didn't deserve. I didn't deserve it. I was a bad person. I did really bad things to a lot of people. But it was something that got to me directly. It bypassed everything else, and it went straight to my heart. And these people, who normally would have been my enemies, and they knew it. It was a small town. They knew who I was. I think they came in there intentionally to kind of poke at me. They came in there, and they showed me compassion when I least deserved it. And because of that, I owe them a tremendous amount of gratitude because it allowed me to once again feel empathy in my life. Since then, uh, I started an organization called Life After Hate, it's a nonprofit that works to educate people on issues of racism and the extreme far right, uh, but also to help pull people out of these hate groups. Because when I was a member and I wanted to get out, there was nobody that I could turn to. I certainly couldn't turn to the people who were still involved. I couldn't, couldn't turn to the police. I couldn't turn to counselors because nobody really wanted anything to do with me. They hadn't believed that I could change. So I started Life After Hate as a way to help people who are going through that change to get out of these groups and to distance themselves away from that. We launched a program this year called Exit USA, which is an anonymous website that people can go to or call or text uh, if they need help getting out of these groups, if they need help breaking away, and we'll provide that help whether it's counseling or job training or tattoo removal or mentorship, uh, that's something that, that we provide to them to get out. I just want to close and say thank you very much for coming today. This is a very important topic. And I'm glad that we're both here because I, I really want to approach uh, extremism from both sides because, as Hedy has said, in the United States since 9-11, more than twice as many people have been killed by white supremacists as have by any foreign terrorist group combined. <coughs> Yet all of our government resources seem to be going to fight this war on terror that's coming from the Middle East, when we have a very serious problem here at home. And I have made it my mission to bring that to light and to help where I can, to bring a unique perspective <coughs> that maybe law enforcement doesn't have, or academics don't have, or mental health professionals don't have. And that's the role of the former, somebody who has been there, somebody who's gone through it, and can understand what these young people are going through and help them get out. So I just want to say thank you again for having me. I look forward to your questions in the panel. And I'll just say, go out there and make good happen. Thank you. Just the back lights, that's possible? Yeah. Yeah, I think that was that less complicated. No, either way. He's going to take off his shirt and there's a tutu underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It's a bear's shirt. It's all bears. While they're getting set up, I just want to add that uh, I met Mubin for the first time in 2011 in, in Dublin, Ireland at a conference called the Summit Against Violent Extremism. Uh, and it was a really mind-bending experience. It was put on by Google Ideas uh, and the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and they essentially brought together 110 people who were formers of extremist groups who had led great lives to meet with survivors of violent extremism to dialogue. And what we learned was amazing. What we learned, first of all, was that it didn't matter what 
extremist group you came from, for the most part we all joined for the same reasons, and for the most part we all got out for the same reasons. And a critical age is 14 years old, 15 years old, because that's when young people are starting to develop their own identities. And it's really easy for savvy recruiters to come in and plant seeds to kind of divert the path a little bit. So I'll end it there, and it's just really great to know this guy. He's a great guy, so I'm really looking forward to the talk. Uh, I, I, five years ago, can you hear me on this? Uh, around, right? <laughs> Test, yeah. It's amazing. It's been five years uh, since we were there, and man, this, uh, even just hearing your story, I mean, it's been five years, so so many things have, have you'll see, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll work a lot of things, it's just my, my mind is blown. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, of course, thank you all for coming, and the organizers for having us. Um, I always love to come to DC, it's a nice place to be. So I'm just going to jump right into it because I, I do have a lot of slides, kind of. Uh, I'll try to keep it quick, but not uh, gloss over what's important. So <clears throat> the the text here, right? So is there a point on this? Yeah, okay. So it says jihad. Okay, lahu shaklun akhar. There's different forms of it. Al muhim. The important thing is Allah tatrok that you don't leave mechanic your place in it. So whether you do it digitally by the USB, jihad by the USB, jihad by the pen, or jihad by the bullet. Okay? Um, <coughs> so what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to get into the academics of it very much. Um, okay. I'm not going to get too much into the academics, and please, the, the academics in here, don't hold me to too hard to this. Um, but basically what I want to show you is nature versus nurture. All right? This is an argument that psychologists have had for a long time. Uh, and really the way, the environment in which you grow up, your parents, the society around you, the kind of value system that you're subjected to, begins to create the paradigm through which you look at the world. And as Christian was saying, uh, there are experiences that begin to resonate with you. Uh, and uh, suddenly the ideas um, you know, make more sense to you. So while in, initially they may be just theoretical, something happens in your life and now suddenly, no, it makes sense. So in this context, it's still not working. Or do I gotta point it that way? No. <laughs> so no problem, we have a... So a number of things pop up for a person. It's usually when they become conscious and aware of the world around them. And it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but uh, geopolitics, things that are happening in the world around you, uh, feelings of deprivation and frustration. If you see the situation around you, it's no good. You look to blame somebody for it. Right? Conflicts over meaning and identity, I think, is the most uh, prevalent factor in this topic, uh, whether it's the white supremacists, the jihadists, the urban street gang. Um, adventure, especially with young men. And in some cases, money. Now, you know, there's a whole uh, academic discussion on radicalization. I make it very simple. Radicalization is a process um, where a lot of things are happening. And at one point, the end result of it is that you, you become an extremist. You take on extreme views. I define extremism as really the willingness to commit uh, a violent act in public spaces or private spaces. Um, and, and the vast majority of radicalized people don't become violent extremists. But what happens is people will manifest their views, uh, you know, their concerns individually or as groups. So you may join a group or you may act alone. But there, there are some observable traits with people who become violent extremists. Making your own propaganda, uh, how secretive you are in the group and if you're collecting intelligence, or if you're checking to see if the cops are following you, counterintelligence. Uh, you are the company you keep, contact with known violent extremists, right? Overseas travel or searches online. Uh, so for example, um, Al-Qaeda's magazine Inspire has a section, how to make a bomb in the kitchen of your mom. And recruiting others, because the more you talk about it, the more you come to believe it, right? You're reinforcing uh, these things in, in, inside your mind. Now these stars are just wild card factors. Uh, so, for example, how does a person go from this all the way down to there? Well, you know, a drone strike has just taken out an entire family. And the surviving family member, he doesn't know anything about religion, doesn't know anything about politics, but he knows he's got to come and get you because you killed his family. 
or a person who's involved in these groups where they feel it's not moving fast enough, right? especially with young people, we want to see change overnight. It's not moving fast enough. They kind of experiment with the group, but they, they move to direct action. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put myself through this continuum. So when I'm growing up, I go to a Quran school, an Indo-Pak style madrasa, wooden benches, boys on one side, girls on the other, a very uh, harsh environment. If you read the Quran wrong, you were hit. Uh, they would make you stand in stress positions. Um, quite different from the public school that I was going to. There I am, front and center. There, color. Stop it. Uh, but diverse. Boys, girls, caring, nurturing environment. I'm not slapped if I make a mistake. And this starts to lay the foundation of, of again, an identity crisis that forms inside me. Now, I joined the Army Cadets as well. This is, this is my family. I have put both of my oldest ones in the Army Cadets. Social engineering, go big or go home. Uh, but what I want, what I, this is a new value system that I'm exposed to. It's a new group that I'm exposed to. And it further gives me, one, it gives me good values, but at the same time, I don't know who am I supposed to be. My community is calling me to one thing. My, you know, family and my friends are calling me to another. Or my friends are calling me to another. There, there's me again. Um, high school, I wasn't bullied. I wasn't picked on. We were the cool kids. Okay, but what happened is it was too non-Muslim for the community, for the people around me, and they made me feel really guilty that you're not a good enough Muslim, right? So I traveled to India and Pakistan. Now, you remember that first section I showed you about things, geopolitics, this and that? Well, two things have already started to manifest. I joined a group which takes me to India and Pakistan, and while I'm in Pakistan, I meet a bunch of guys just like that, turban, beards, thobes, and guns, lots of guns, rocket propelled grenades, um, GP, you know, general purpose machine guns, you know, magazine, uh, belts of ammunition. And for me, this was it. This was the identity I was looking for. It had the religion, it had the adventure, it had the weapons. And I was what I call bit by the jihadi bug. That was 1995. The Taliban had just come to power in Afghanistan. So I come back now. That's me. And you remember the first category? Well, now all of these are manifesting in me. All right? I, I, I move into uh, the jihadi Salafi groups uh, who are all about the geopolitics and they're all about looking at the Quran through that prism. So, I mean, these things were happening. The Taliban take over, Chechnya, Second Intifada. And uh, same thing, we start to recruit other kids. The only way that you're going to bring about the salvation of the Muslim world is to fight jihad. That's the only way. So now look at, of the last category of identifiable behaviors, look at how many are manifesting in my life. Okay? So I was right on the verge of, of going over. Three of my friends, two of them went to Pakistan, one went to Yemen, and all three didn't make it back. So I get married in 1998. Uh, there's my seven year period from uh, the age of 19 to oh, 26 is when I went. So 20, 23 is when I got married, 1998. Whoa. Uh, and it calmed me down a bit. And uh, these are you know, cognitive openings, we call them. So during that process, a number of things can happen to you that make you amenable to certain ideas. So for me, I got married, it calmed me down a little bit. Uh, but then 9 11 happened. Now I usually. I usually talk about this, I mean, and, and I'll be honest, I initially celebrated the 9-11 attacks. I was on my way to work, I heard on the radio that a plane had hit the building. I, immediately I said, Allahu Akbar, God is great. I got to the workplace that I was at, it was a federal building, uh, student loans, the real terrorists, I tell you. Uh, and uh, I had a, you know, ID, government ID, and that elevator ride, up to the floor was the most uncomfortable elevator ride ever in my life. People were checking to say I got his ID, yeah. I get into my workplace. My bosses are more concerned that, hey, if anyone comes and says anything to you, you come and tell us, you know, we'll take care of it. I'm thinking, look, these people are worried about me and like people have died. So, so I realized, you know what, I don't know my religion. I need to go and study it. I went to Syria in 2002. In, two th in, in Syria, I, I was actually in the class um, my oldest son's name is Mujahid, right? one who does jihad. 
So when the a teacher asked, what is your name? I said, Abu Mujahid, father of Mujahid. So he kind of chuckled and he says, oh, are you a Mujahid? Like, I'm a Mujahid? I said, yeah, I am, you know. And he says, okay, what's the meaning of jihad, right? Ma ma'na al-jihad? So I said, it means fighting. And he said, no, fighting means qital. So that was the first point that I realized, uh, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. And in fact, <laughs> look at this educator. He knew right away from the way that my attitude was and the way that I came across, this guy needs an intervention. So he said to me, you know what, why don't you come and spend some time with me and we'll go over the verses of the Qur'an that talk about jihad. And we'll, we'll talk, we'll discuss. So what I call theological reframing is basically going through the verses of the Qur'an. And he was a Sufi sheikh, a uh, very loving person. I mean, just light is emanating from this person. Uh, you know, didn't judge me, didn't say, you know, maybe I made myself feel stupid. Just the way in which he would respond to me sometimes. For example, chapter 9, verse 5. The way we spit it out is, kill the unbelievers wherever you find them. Well, the first thing he said, well, do you normally start reading from verse 5? <laughs> so, I said, oh, good point. So when you go to verse 1, it tells you, this is talking with a very specific group. You know, the ones, the polytheists, who broke the treaty of peace between you. And when you go to verse 4, directly preceding verse 5, it says, not included in this are those who did not break the treaty and are not bad to you. So that tells you it's a very specific group of people who are doing a very specific thing. But what you've done is you create a general rule out of it. Now suddenly Jews and Christians are poly polytheists? The Quran never refers to Jews and Christians as polytheists. They refer to them as Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book. So I became disillusioned from the theory versus the practice. I saw a real police state in Syria. But most of all, I had a newfound respect for the rights for Muslims in the West. I was discriminated against because of the way I looked. Uh, it was the American school in Damascus, Ahmed East, that hired me because we don't discriminate on the basis of religion. And they were paying me crazy money. So, hey, the great Satan isn't so bad after all, right? <laughs> I returned back to Canada and the first week I'm back, first Canadian arrested on terrorism charges, Momin Kawaja. Momin Kawaja sat beside me in the mother of San as a kid. I called the security, the security intelligence service to give a character reference for the family. Uh, it was be out of their hands, it was in the court now, but they said, hey, you know, we'd really like to come chat with you if you don't mind. So they came, they chatted, we talked, I told them my story, they said, look, we like the way you think, we want you to consult for us. We want you to tell us who you think is a threat and is not a threat. And so I began working undercover assignments um, for some time. Um, and it was online and on the ground. One of those cases moved over to be a criminal prosecution. In the Canadian system, domestic security intelligence is done by a separate organization, and federal policing is done by the federal police. So I traversed over to the RCMP. Now, I'm going to also put, just very quickly, some of the individuals from the case through that continuum. So look at him, where he's born, right? 79 to 89, a war is going on, grows up in a refugee uh, camp. Uh, family settles in Mississauga, right? He's an outsider. Zakaria Mara, non-practicing Muslim father, relatively practicing Christian mother, right? Look at the parental unit and how that's influencing him. The father's gone all the time. Finally, when the parents come, they divorce. He tells me, look, my dad threw the keys to me and said, see you later, I never saw him again. The convert converts from Hinduism while he's in the military. Right? Withdrew from the service because he feared, you know, he didn't want, he felt that he was being uh, harassed over growing of his beard. Ali Diri, he was smuggling guns for the main ringleader, Fahim Ahmed. While he was in prison, he was recruiting other people. So keeping in mind, when we talk about interventions, it's the whole spectrum. It's before they get there, it's the preventive stuff, the universal stuff that you do at the start. It's the uh, uh, indicated, when there are indicators, you intervene. And then there's a targeted intervention where the person's in a prison. Well, after he served his sentence, he got a false passport, joined Jabhat Nusra in Syria, and died. Yeah, gangster culture. It's not, so it's the, it's the mentality that comes with the culture that I think feeds into it. Bravado and codes of honor linked to violence, okay, in, in particular. So, I mean, what starts to happen is they start to watch the jihadi videos. This is Nicholas Berg, the first beheading video that was made public. 
Um, so my formula is this, regularly visiting these sites that give ideological justification and frequently viewing them. So when you're watching scenes of death and destruction all the time, it's going to impact you. It will impact you. All right? That puts a person at severe risk of recruitment. Okay? Just, I'm just going to play just a few seconds of this, but to give you an idea of the propaganda that Al-Qaeda was putting out 10 years ago. Battle between good and evil. The idea of rulers as apostates. Yeah, so you can see the, you know, the Americans and all that, right? So I have their internet. It was supposed to be internationalization, but you get the point. Uh, the internet. I mean, there was no Facebook. There was no Twitter. Right? But there were, chat, there were chat rooms, there were password protected chat rooms. And it wasn't just these guys on, online, it was other people from other places. Blob3 are from the UK, uh, including one of the youngest that was ever arrested for terrorism charges. These two from, were from Atlanta, Georgia, who came up to DC, took some pictures of some of the famous sites, and sent that video off to, uh, uh, off to Pakistan. So what happens is, in 2005, from talk to action, these guys physically, Abid Khan gets on a plane, comes to Toronto, these two get on a bus, and they come to Toronto. Now what starts to happen is, Khan goes to Pakistan, one goes to Bangladesh, he goes to Pakistan, meets Abid Khan, this guy goes to a training camp in Pakistan, and these two decide, we're gonna have a training camp in Canada where we're gonna prepare guys to commit terrorist acts. So for the law enforcement types, here's your link analysis chart, uh, you know, it, I mean, it can tentacle out very quickly into an international investigation, right? Uh, so basically, you know, I, I'm sent in to infiltrate this group. There's a, 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 um, um, a presentation that's going on at this banquet hall. Uh, I go in, I talk to them. I'll, I won't bore you with the details of the infiltration part, but basically I befriended them, uh, and they basically told me, I told them I had army cadet training and this and that, and they said, hey, you know, why don't you come to this training thing that we're doing? In fact, you can actually help train some of our guys. Here's a surveillance picture of Zakaria Amara's car. He told his wife that he was going for Umrah, which is the out-of-season pilgrimage. He was living in his car in December in Canada, all right? Uh, those are, you can see the maps down there. So he had already been checking out the location. I mean, this was the thing, because I was an undercover and there is this, you know, idea that the mere presence of an undercover equals entrapment, that's false. Uh, these, these guys had selected the location, had already gone to the, selected it, visited the site, recruited all the people who were going to go there before I got involved. So they got busted is what happened. Um, top picture shows the various prayers. They would go to different mosques to seek to recruit young kids into their group. This is a sticky note at the bottom here. It says, don't tell them anything, just give them jihadi dawah. Give a false name. Keep them on the down low, right? Don't reveal all the information. This is the video they made of the training camp. Now all the stuff is of course superimposed onto it. But remember that sign of making your own propaganda as one of the indicators? Well here you have it, right? And it's a stage scene where a bunch of guys come up from the crest of the hill with the flag, basically showing that, you know, come on up, We've, we're planting our flag here, and basically we're here to take over, all right? There's the planting, and there it is. The plan is simple. Three one-ton ammonium nitrate truck bombs. That's the Murrah building, Oklahoma City. Right? That's what a one-ton ammonium nitrate truck bomb does. So here is Zachariah's house. Now look at the top, okay? When the, pay attention at the top. Don't worry, you'll see the phone come back again. There is a baby seat. There is a, a toy jumper in which the baby can play. Right? So this is going to spark. You see the baby seat, you see the toy. He's literally in his mother's basement. So I'm gonna let this play a bit because I want you to see. So he, he dials it, start a timer. One, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, 1,011, 1,012, 1,013, 1,014, 1,000, boom, bomb goes off. When he was caught, he said it was a, it was a school project. <laughs> like, yeah. Learning from public cases. Moimin Kawaja was involved in the London fertilizer bomb plot. So what these guys did is they put wax on the doors to make sure nobody 
uh, came in and um, uh, played with any of the stuff that they had. So they are unloading what they think is ammonium nitrate. Okay. Um, they go inside. They're placing in boxes that have uh, plastic uh, garbage bags, and they come outside and they hear something. And oh damn, get the hell down on the ground. And that was it. And they got arrested. So I'm going to jump quickly to what happened is, uh, so they got arrested in 2006. I gave testimony in five legal hearings over four years uh, that ended in 2010. After that, I got online. I got into Twitter, Facebook, uh, with my identity. I wanted to confront the extremists with, their, with, with proper Islamic training. And here is Al-Shabaab's Twitter account, which has long since I mean, been taken down. But they're telling you, it's not the number of people that are killed. It's the number of people that are watching. And there's a great quote that I'll never forget. Media gives terrorism a longevity it might not otherwise enjoy. And there's a reason why we keep thinking there's a jihadi around every corner. It's because that's all we're being fed, right? They start asking questions. These are, these are kids online on ask.fm who can go and ask people in Syria, what kind of phone should I bring with me? Or, if I join ISIS, will I have to wait some time or can I go and fight right away? And they tell you, look, weapons free, ammo's free. When there's a chance to fight, you will go. For married people, it's not just for the kids, right? Again, the range, the spectrum, right? Or the burning, important question, are there good-looking women? Because these are young boys, mostly, with unnatural uh, gender interactions. They can't have a conversation with, a, with, a, with the opposite sex without it being hypersexualized. So I always, I always say this, is it any wonder they talk about, the only time they talk about sex is with a virgin in paradise after they've killed themselves. Right? So some profiles, I mean, look, good looking guy. I mean, from Europe, he's following me on Twitter. He's dead now, of course. But I want to keep an eye on Mujahid for life. I'm going to circle back with him and give me a five minute warning. Cause, yeah. So just some more profiles of, so in Syria, he's telling you, right? But I started to see, uh, aside from the intel, juicy intel stuff, food pictures. Because what they were trying to show is, we're living a really nice year. Kebabs? Yeah, we got that. Uh, he's a Canadian guy, by the way, also dead. Look, how can I not take a picture of that? And this is my favorite. Indo-Pak British in Syria referring to pizza as home-cooked food. Right? Talk about conflicted identities. Look at this. Jihadi cats. Even the cats are radicalized. Right? Because they played on this. Because everyone watches cat videos, right? Kids watch cat videos. So with tagging cats in the pictures and videos, your kid can go online looking at cat pictures and end up seeing an ISIS video. That's how it works. But they're also posting, hey, IEDs. Or te teasing the government. Oh, so the UK is afraid I'm going to come back with the skills I've gained. Right? Look at, I'm just going to play a, uh, just a little bit of it because there's some real graphic stuff in here and like, uh, yeah, I just don't want to do that. But look at 10 years difference, the quality of the videos. Whoops, I don't know what just happened there. Uh, just bear with me one second. Okay, let's do that. Perfect, thank you. And, and you can see the narrative, geopolitical narrative. Imagine a young boy looking at this. I mean, it's exciting. Of the dark wave of the Crusader force. Crusaders, right? The religious land war. of two rivers bore life to a mission that would transform the political landscape of the world. A mission that would herald a return to the Khilafah and revive the creed of Tawheed. It was the establishment of the Islamic State, nourished by the blood of the truthful Mujahideen. Watch the music that comes in, very melodious. On so your eyes and your ears are just inundated. Leader. Thus, the war between Iman and Kufr was ignited. You are with us or against us. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. They thought they were one. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. 
in the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. A lie. The flames were only beginning to intensify. Obama then claimed it was. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut it, but I mean, you get the idea, right? The women. Right now, I have lots of profile. I've been doing a lot of this, like all of 2013, all of 2014, and a bit in 2015, because I just got sick and tired of arguing with kids in their mama's basements. Uh, I have a life. I keep reminding them. Uh, so the women, and this quote really sums it up for me. Caring wife of the Mujahid today, loving mother of the Mujahid tomorrow. Gender role stereotyping, right? Uh, the idea of populating the new Islamic state. It's an exciting project, something to be a part of, right? You've been hearing about the caliphate, you've been hearing about this utopian Islamic state where Muslims will live happily ever after. Well, they want to be a part of it, right? But here's, look at how they show their love, right? For their, for their children, right? And this is deliberate, right? This is to, to, to train the children, right? To be used as uh, child soldiers eventually, right? Child suicide bombers, right? I mean, look at, look at the stuff that they're, I mean, uh, just a few seconds of it. Right? They took, they took Yazidi kids, just like the child soldiers do. Made them kill their parents, and now, and now they're using them as soldiers. Right? I mean, how, how, how old is this kid? Right? I'm looking for that guy, personally, but I won't get into that, because I get angry. Uh, ladies, your jihadi boyfriend awaits. Your swashbuckling jihadi prince will save you from... I mean, I do make light of it, but if you can imagine, again, the young girl side. Unnatural gender interaction. Some girls who can't go out, talk to boys without there being some scandal, so they stay at home. And their parents hear this melodious, religious sounding music coming from their rooms, and they think, oh, my daughter is so pious, your daughter's talking to her jihadi boyfriend online. Other young people who are her peers, right? Other like-minded youth, alienated in a generational alienation from their parents who are from the old country, who can't relate to their kids. So if I could just, like, I have five children, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to repeat the mistakes that I think other parents have done. Don't make it such a big deal if they're talking to a boy or whatever it is. You know, you know your values. You've raised them in your values. Tell them with tenderness, with niceness, so that they don't feel that they need to rebel against you, right? Uh, the propaganda that they use. You know, YOLO, you only live once. Well, popular culture narrative. Well, they're flipping now. You only die once. Why not make it martyr? Right? Or... They're not listening to us. And so as soon as they picked up the gun, oh, now they're listening. Sometimes you just got to get up and go. So your counter messaging or some of the things you might want to say is, hey, maybe you should think about it before you go, right? Or is it any wonder that, you know, gangsters and criminals are joining this group, right? Sometimes people with the worst past create the best futures, right? We hear and we obey. You know where that's from? It's from Call of Duty. Because this is our Call of Duty. Understand? I mean, here is Grand Theft Auto. ISIS version. This is Miami International Airport. I mean, if you are so inclined, you can go and use these first-person games as practice. Not saying video games make you do it. I'm saying you've already decided to do it. This just gives you a form by which you can manifest it. I mean, the terrorist Andres Brevik, uh, that's what he did. He practiced on these games, right? Now, I'm not going to get too much into the theology, but this is one hadith, statement of the Prophet, alayhi salam, where he talks about khawarij. Khawarij are a deviant sect that was castigated by the Prophet, alayhi salam, and makes it, makes it very clear. Their Quran, they recite the Quran, but it would not pass their throats. They're very superficial about their religion. And they will leave Islam. I am of the belief that khawarij are out of Islam. There is a difference in opinion in some of the Muslims, that's fine. They're allowed to be wrong. <laughs> um, but the most important thing is, and I don't you have to read all of it, but there are two things here that are mentioned that the Khawarij were known to do. Ibn Kathir is writing in the 1200s, and he talks about two things. One is they hijack entire cities and, and, and fortify themselves through it. So this is what they're doing in Raqqa, Musal, Ramadi, everywhere. This is what they do. And amazing, the second part is how they would entice the children to emigrate in secret and join them in their Islamic state. From the 1200s, he's writing this. Okay. So, 
to counter messaging and the kinds of different things that people can do. Suleiman Bakhit, good friend of mine, amazing guy, he, write, he makes comics. He, in his words, terrorism is disguised as heroism. That scar on his face is because the extremists attacked him with a straight razor and cut him from here to here. And he's got this wicked looking scar, but I'll, I'll, you know, he's really, really cool. I mean, this is an example of some of the comics um, that he's been drawing. Anti-misogyny narratives, anti-patriarchy narratives. Uh, because kids, they watch, they look at cartoons, they love that stuff. Right? Cartoons are great. To, to show the message, right? and that's a priest, right? Or this, right? to understand the difference, okay? Coming back to Mujahid for Life, I micro-engaged to this guy, micro-engagement, one-on-one -on -one counseling, for a year and a half, okay? Who in DHS has time for that? Who at State Department, think again, turn away Twitter account has time for that, right? It's not going to be the job of government agencies to do that. It's not. So, now look at, look at what he's saying. He was the second top ISIS account. Um, no Shia allowed, right? Anti-democracy, democracy, loyal to the caliphate, harsh on the kufar, right? See the guy in the bottom left? Is that your European guy who was following me on Twitter? Well, I know there's a lot of text here, but he considered himself a diplomat for ISIS, but I, this is really what gets me here, about he brings a rare view from inside its echo chamber. When I was inside the ISIS bubble, okay, so that closed bubble, closed environment in which you reject other, closed bubble, I was thinking emotionally, emotional thinking versus intellectual thinking. When you're younger, you don't have the intellectual capabilities. So understand, when, they, when you're dealing with a young kid who's engaging with this stuff, you really have to go slowly and softly with them. You can't just break them like that. They're not, they're, they're, too, they're too small. The brain is still too malleable. Right? And it was an obsession, just blind devotion. So there's a lot of things I think you can unpack from his statement, and you can apply directly in the case of young males, females. Um, we were speaking with another guy, Amriki Witness. Amriki Witness, Mujahid for Life, and I. Amriki Witness turned out to be that 17-year-old kid from Virginia. Crohn's disease, small kid, talking about interventions, look at how this worked. He told me the FBI were asking his friends about him. I told him, I said, dude, if the FBI are involved, they're moving towards a prosecution. You need to be very careful about what's going on. Now, unbeknownst to me, and this became public <coughs> later on, the FBI approached Imam Majid. The kid went to the Imam, went to a, a, a summer camp, but didn't work out for him because he's a scrawny little 17-year-old with Crohn's disease. He's a zero. But online, he was a hero. He was a superhero. And so he went back into it. And then his mother, what, what could the mother do? The mother called the FBI. What could the FBI do? You shall implement these laws. Not you can implement the laws when you feel like it. They had to arrest him. He recruited an 18-year-old kid who, who then went to Syria. And, I mean, chances are that kid's going to die. That's why he got arrested. It, I mean, I saw some of the articles that came out completely fraudulent and misleading. It wasn't just because he was posting things online. No, he recruited a guy who then went to Syria, right? Tell that to his, tell that to that kid's parents that, oh, you went too hard on this kid, right? Because now those parents are without kid. Shami Witness was the top account. Millions of people checked his account. Turns out, Indian from Bangalore. Because even ISIS needs to outsource to India. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mujahid for Life. Now going back and arguing against ISIS, and he says here, I'm a murtad, I'm an apostate, after leaving the ISIS fan club. This is what they started to call him, right? Uh, one last story in just a few slides. White girl, Seattle, Washington. I think you read about this, uh, how ISIS recruited a Sunday school teacher. Okay? Um, now look at the vulnerability here. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So you know the decision-making capabilities are lowered. Parents no longer have custody of her. Elderly grandparents have custody of her. Siblings, several years younger. Where is she living? Outside of the city. You know, where there's no interaction with other members of her own community. 14, 18 hours a day she's online. They started to, to, to groom her and recruit her. They wanted to bring her over. So I got tagged into a conversation that was happening on Twitter. 
basically because they knew what I was doing. I, I show my name, my face, because so I can make the argument. So you take Islam from strangers over the internet? Do you even know their faces? Do you even know who they are? Right? So it kept going back and forth. She's basically saying here, you know, uh, the verses of the Quran, they're giving me verses. So I said to her, I would love to see these verses that you quote. Okay? So it goes back and forth. I give her, you know, that's okay, all they want is God. I said, wonderful, you will never find God by spreading evil. Never. I give her a legit source of Islamic studies that she can go to and access. And look at what she says at the top. I'm sincere when I say they've always been kind to me. Very vulnerable girl, right? Any kind of intimacy someone shows to her, oh my God, they love me. But they read the messages. I knew they would and got mad. So who's they? There are other recruiters who were online that I've engaged with because I took some back channels and found out who they were, who they are. Turns out they were individuals that I had been engaging before. They had blocked me because they knew what I was about and they got mad. And they were telling her, this guy's a spy. He's trying to get you arrested, this, that, and the other. I'm not. I'm online. I'm, yeah, a big, great spy with his name and face <laughs> online. They're wonderful, right? FBI, you guys suck. You're hiring Canadians now. <laughs> so... I'm, what I'm saying here is their kindness was a fake to draw you in. Last slide, I went really hard on her. She realized, you know, look, I'm not like that anymore. Uh, I think you hate me because I didn't listen. So I realized, you know, so you have to humble yourself. I said, look, look, uh, Allah forgive me if I gave that impression, you know, but it's okay, just stay away from those extremist idiots. So now the, it, it, the recruitment was blocked. She's, she's, she is on Facebook, but she's using her real face. She's using her real name. And, you know, she's just one of many who have been prevented. I, I only have the half an hour. Um, you have my book over there. That's my email. If ever you want to get in touch with me for whatever reason, if you have a question, you're dealing with a case, absolute confidentiality. Um, really, I, I have to thank all of you. Christian's story resonated with me very much. You see this. I mean, the seven years kept coming up. You got out at 19. I got in at 19. Right? Um, at the end of the day, understand that you're dealing with deviants. Okay? Why I use the term khawarij. Uh, these are deviant people who Islam has castigated and condemned. They are trying to steal as many people as they can. Because the vast majority of Muslims don't buy into their stuff. Tens of millions of Muslims live in Europe and North America. What's the number of foreign fighters that they have? 5,000. What's 5,000 divided by tens of millions? Nothing. But it's what the one or two can do when they come back, or those that are here what they could do that, that create this fear in us. So, so like Christian said, you know, it's, uh, uh, or Hadiyah was saying, it's people from different backgrounds. Don't think just because, you know, you come from a priestly background uh, or a non-religious background, you're going to somehow, you need to be watching this. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, hey. Can, you talk about I don't know. can you talk in this? Is yeah. oh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, that was really exciting. Sorry, I was also sitting over there being like, yeah, keep going. This is amazing. Um, so, I'm glad to be on this panel. And so, I am just going to talk a little bit about our program here at ICC, the Crossroads program. And I guess while I'm describing the program, just as a test for all of you guys. Try and keep in mind what these two guys have been saying and see if parts of our program are resonating with some of those facets. Just all of that. At, at the end there'll be a quiz. They're in charge of it. Okay. So, um, the Crossroads program started in 2013 and our mission has been to promote social harmony and plurality through community outreach, assistance, and empowerment. Our target population are youth and their families from the Middle East, South Asia, North, East, and West Africa. The majority of our clients are Muslim. Um, they're mostly refugees, asylum seekers, recent immigrants, low to moderate income levels. And our services basically include everything. So without getting too technical, there are a few different components of the model. So on the first level, we're making sure that all of our clients are connected to social services. This includes everything from employment assistance, to language development, to food stamps, and donations for school supplies, gift cards, and more. Some of this includes linking people to our own volunteers and our own donations. We just opened up a small donation center now here in the building. We're rapidly taking up all the space. 
Um, and people can come pick out winter clothing, Target gift cards, household items, and more. Um, the ICC has been running its own school supply drive since before the Crossroads program was even established. Um, the Muslim Women's Coalition donates these wonderful Ramadan baskets to our families that include bags of rice, dates, personal items, and more. I know that they're represented over here too, so big shout out to them. Um, and this year we even had toys donated for Eid gifts. And when I say toys, I mean the good ones. Um, and so, you know, these are gifts that we can give our clients to, you know, to celebrate the holidays. So they don't feel like they're getting a handout, but that they're getting a celebration, that they're a part of the celebration. So for example, when we give somebody a $100, gift, a $100 giant gift card, we say, this is to celebrate Eid, do something nice for the family. It feels like a celebration, and again, not another reminder that our clients are struggling to put food on the table, despite their best efforts. One refugee client, for example, he had been seeing us for months for counseling for trauma. He always talked about how much it hurt him that despite his best efforts, he couldn't afford to buy his kids the toys that they always asked for. And around Eid, we sent him home, probably with the most toys of all of our clients, and he almost cried. He said it was one of the best gifts he could have been given. And I don't say this to understand how great our counseling is, but apparently the toys are really what did it. Um, so other times, we are coordinating with multiple outside agencies. When we're connecting clients to these outside agencies for services, we're not simply handing our clients a brochure, sending them on their way, and waiting for a postcard. Our clients can have a lot of barriers in accessing these services, from language barriers, transportation, cultural barriers, such as maybe the stigma of, of actually getting social services, perceived discrimination, and more. We also link clients to crisis services. So when someone walks in with an eviction notice, or if they are homeless, we connect them to services around the county. Our first year of the program, our first client that faced homelessness actually came in on Christmas Eve. She was one of our non-Muslim clients, so in true ICC fashion, we also made sure that our kids had Christmas gifts that year. We also loaded them up on tons of candy during each visit, but that's another story. I don't know how much the parents appreciated that one. Um, our next level of service includes strengthening community and family resources. This is one of the things that makes our model so unique. When we help build upon the strengths of the wider community, we're building sustainable solutions. So this includes support groups addressing domestic violence or stress management. We have youth groups that include our Global Citizen Forum that provides youth with leadership development skills, communication skills, conflict mediation skills, um, internet safety, personal wellness skills, and more. If there are issues that our kids are passionate about, we want to make sure they have the skills to address these issues in constructive, meaningful ways. We have trained them in advocacy, blogging, podcasting, songwriting, photography, and more. There's a bit of an artistic bias that we're very proud of because we know what we're competing against. Um, we conduct trainings for providers, schools, community members on topics of Islam, refugee resettlement, and more recently, bullying of Muslim youth. When we provide these trainings, we are told that people had no idea how serious these issues are. They ask, how can we help? Every person that we train becomes a part of the community support that youth need to thrive. They become part of a network of positive people building positive messages of inclusion and acceptance. Last week, we testified at our county council to advocate for more resources for incoming, youth, for incoming refugees. When we shared our statistics, though, about bullying from Muslim youth, it pretty much stole the show and everyone was shocked. We had surveyed over 100 Muslim youth and found that one in five students felt intimidated, harassed, humiliated, bullied, or emotionally and physically abused by classmates because they are Muslim. The number jumped to one in four students when considering only the male respondents. 10% of students felt like a teacher or school administrator had treated them unfairly because they are Muslim. 15% of students felt isolated or excluded from social situations because they are Muslim. The chair of the council said it was simply unacceptable. Next week, we're also doing a presentation on issues that affect Muslim youth, including bullying at one of our largest high schools here in Montgomery County, to improve the capacity of faculty and staff to address these issues. Lastly, on an individual level, we're providing counseling, mentoring, intensive case management. Our clients are struggling with a lot of trauma. Everything ranging from unimaginable torture from some of our refugee and asylee clients to domestic violence. 
People who have seen their family members murdered in front of them or witnessed other atrocities, and especially now in light of how these can be such catalyzing experiences. We see depression, anxiety, adjustment disorders. Many of our clients report physical health problems ranging from stomach pains to back pains to headaches. Of course we coordinate with their medical providers, but we also know that there are mental health issues behind a lot of these symptoms. We see a lot of grief and loss, grief over loss of life, as well as loss of ways of life. So loss of familiar environments, being surrounded by family at one point, knowing how to navigate the system, and then being thrown into a new system altogether. We see loss of significance. So that's a loss in a sense of belongingness, meaningful existence, control, self-esteem. Our clients, before they came to the US, a lot of them, they took pride in their jobs. They felt like they were doing something, they were a part of society, part of a community, doing something for a greater good. Here, they're struggling to even find a job. And, and when they find that job, chances are it's in the service industry, where you know, they don't have that same sense of, you know, we're helping people, we're here as a part of a larger purpose. Instead, especially for the ones who maybe are driving cabs for Uber or sidecar, you know, they're literally dependent on ratings from sometimes very rude, very irrational passengers. So as a quick PSA, if any of you guys are actually in Uber or sidecar or Lyft, please give your drivers a five-star rating. It's a very weird system and literally like, their livelihood can depend on it. So when we first started this work, we heard so much about how mental health is stigmatized in the Muslim community. And there's a lot of truth to this. The stigma holds a lot of people back from accessing mental health services. However, we know that it's too easy to blame everything on stigma and the fact that, well, mental health is just a tough field. Everyone wants a pill these days, no one wants to come in and really talk and work on their problems. In reality, though, when Muslims have culturally competent or culturally appropriate providers in care, we have found that they're very forthcoming about their mental health issues. When the space is there, when we pour clients a cup of tea, make them feel respected and never judged, they open up almost instantly. So the onus is on us as the providers to welcome clients, to seek out clients in the community rather than sitting back and thinking, well, Muslims, mental health just doesn't mix. So I wanted to touch briefly on acculturation stress as well. I know that the two speakers have talked so much about this, so bear with me while I throw some, so some social science language at it too. Um, we see this a lot in our clients. Sometimes the term acculturation is just thrown around so much though, but we don't really know the terms. They can get kind of muddied. So acculturation is basically the process of cultural and psychological change that follows intercultural contact. Everyone with me? Okay. Enculturation is the process of socialization to and maintenance of norms and values of one's heritage culture. So let's take the example of an Iraqi refugee coming to America, let's call her Zainab. Acculturation are the changes that occur in Zainab and her family upon resettling in America. This exchange, though, is a two-way street. Just as Zainab may experience changes and even stress on an individual level, America as a whole, as well as what it means to be American, also changes and grows with the addition of each new wave of immigration. Enculturation is the process by which Zainab maintains Iraqi norms and values, again, very broadly defined. So early approaches to acculturation look at it as a very one-dimensional process, where acculturation is on a single continuum. You know, you're low acculturation, then there's high acculturation to the dominant white culture. As an immigrant individual such as Zainab, as she progresses in this process, it's presumed that a higher level of American cultural values, beliefs, attitudes, and practices is incorporated. While you know, she discards some of her Iraqi cultural values, beliefs, attitudes, behaviors on this road to acculturation. As you can imagine, that's quite a racist assumption that somehow Zainab may be better off for discarding her values and traditions and self in order to be the good immigrant. Or on the flip side, to be seen as the bad Iraqi by some, by some for seemingly accepting beliefs or values that are too American. These definitions also bring up black and white representations of culture, where one can definitively say being Iraqi means this and being American means that. Um, there are so, these are some of the stressors that our clients discuss when talking about discrimination, racism, feeling like, like they don't belong. Even though this model has been replaced by more multidimensional models, a lot of the inherent problems in this definition still exist today. For example, let's say that in the example of Zainab, she has a son named Omar. He's been living in the US, he speaks decent English, wears jeans, a t-shirt, has friends. Now let's say Omar starts acting out all of a sudden, skipping classes, not submitting homework assignments. 
Omar needs help. But his counselor thinks, you know, Omar, he's pretty Americanized now. He's acculturated, assimilated. His issue isn't about culture or religion. I don't know if he's a good fit for your program. I've heard this more than once. I have some nods over here. Um, what does it mean to be Americanized exactly? And how is Omar suddenly no longer a product of complex cultural and religious environments and values and beliefs? We do not just see clients who on the surface are having issues related to culture. I don't even know what that means yet. Um, rather, our clinicians know how to address culture at every step in the process. Not, it's not something we throw on at the beginning, at the end, pay some lip service to. So for a lot of the youth that we work with, we know that we cannot separate culture from them and from their issues. Acculturation stress includes difficulty adapting to U.S. cultural norms, difficulty maintaining their culture of origin, conflict with family members and cultural adjustment, isolation, exclusion, discrimination, happening in overt ways as well as in subtle ways. When youth pick up on messages that being Muslim is a problem or that, or that being too American is a problem, they can feel marginalized, which basically means that they don't feel that they fit in anywhere, which I know both of our speakers have alluded to. And it's, a diff and it's a very familiar story for us. In Omar's case, he may be too American for the Iraqis, but too Iraqi for the Americans. He may feel that he is living a double life, or that there are so many different parts to himself that he can't seem to keep straight. These questions of who am I are normal, healthy, developmentally appropriate for you to be asking. It's in navigating these questions where growth occurs. These are the types of questions that we also explore in our group work. You know, we bring together diverse youth to come, meet, you know, cross some of those bridges. We explore it in our mentoring, in our individual counseling. But what happens when youth are left alone to answer these questions and left at the conclusion of, I don't fit in anywhere? Who's going to come along and say, you know what? You fit in with us. The ballet troupe? Or one of these guys from back in the day. Um, so who's it going to be? Um, we know that the kids who do the best are the ones who embrace a bicultural or, or integrated identity. So in the case of Zainab and Omar, they feel a part of Iraqi as well as American communities. They recognize that what it means to be Iraqi or American is not a static black and white definition. Rather, it's complex and diverse. And most importantly, being Iraqi or Muslim is not seen as being at odds with being American. One of our Iraqi youth clients was telling me, how much he struggled coming to America, and how much discrimination and hardship he faced in Jordan as an Iraqi refugee there. He told me that he's proud to call himself an Iraqi American and looks forward to finishing college, becoming a dentist one day. He said he wants to go back to Jordan one day and tell them, I'm an Iraqi American. Look at how far I've come. So to conclude, um, just a few tips um, for parents and providers and everyone else who didn't have a Super Bowl party to go to tonight. Um, one. So ask youth about bullying. You know, familiar, familiarize yourself with the warning signs. They might not be very forthcoming about talking about it. There's a lot of shame, there's a lot of embarrassment, some guilt. Um, learn how to report it. What do you do? If you don't know, check with us afterwards. Um, we're always here to provide guidance. And if your kids are not being bullied, fantastic. Make sure that they're not the ones bullying others. Or ask about the kids who are being bullied. What are they doing to help those kids? Are they upstanders? Are they bystanders? And again, they better not be the bullies. Okay, two, let's do what we can to foster bicultural identities. Let's talk about culture. Let's be very aware of the messaging that we are sending to youth. Are we suggesting to them that they're Muslim, Iraqi, Pakistani, American, Italian, whatever it is, identities are not welcome? That they are somehow a problem? Do we tell youth that they are not like other Muslims? Or do we tell our kids, stop being so American? What does that mean? We are sending the message to our kids that being American is a bad thing, or that being Muslim is a bad thing. Let's be specific when we are talking about certain behaviors or attitudes. And on the topic of acculturation, let's not make assumptions about families and individuals. Let's promote self-awareness in ways that honor and respect people's cultural heritage. Differences are not deficiencies. How do we build upon them? On the topic of language, and I'm almost done, um, we need to be mindful that we're discussing politics in sensitive and age-appropriate ways. So when we see Donald Trump on TV, do we throw our hands up and say, oh, everyone hates Muslims? We are essentially sending our kids out into the world with the message, everyone hates you. Sure, you can say, well, we didn't mean to suggest that everyone hates Muslims. Well, you just said that. You know, so be very mindful of your language. Online safety. Know what youth are doing online. I think the speakers touched upon this better than I could have. 
Um, you know, there's no boogeyman behind every IP address, but at the same time, there's so much that youth are exposed to. And I know that everybody here is thinking, you know, my kids, they're good kids, they're not involved with any of that. Well, it's not about being a good kid or a bad kid. These are not evil masterminds. These are not bad kids sitting on their computer. They're vulnerable kids that are looking for a place to belong. Um, listening to a lot of crazy music, too. Um, so lastly, seek support and services. We are, of course, here for referrals. If you think someone's a good fit for our program, ask us. If you're not sure, just come to us. If you think someone's a good fit, but you don't know how to tell them about our program, no problem. We'll come in and explain the program to them. As far as other providers, um, we have a list in the back, in Hidea's hand, of other providers. Um, we actually invited pretty much all of them on this list to come and speak, but unfortunately we couldn't compete with Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> I have to say... Every single one of them. Like, oh, no, it's Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> but, but we also understand that, because you know, even if, if the Ravens are playing tonight, I don't think I would have been here either. I would have, I would have faked an illness. <laughs> um, so please take a look at this list. I mean, some of them include larger nonprofit organizations like Family Services, some of them are county providers like the Crisis Center, um, the Street Outreach Network, so it's a pretty diverse list. And so, thank you guys so much, and I'm looking forward to asking these guys a bunch more questions. Thank you. I'd like to open it up, I'd like to open up for questions. Who would like to start? Well, so, all of us are here to know the question, is someone recruiting our kids? What's the answer? Yes. <laughs> there, there are people recruiting your kids for all types of things, right? So it could be extremism, it could be, you know, a click, it could be whatever. You're, every kid is being recruited by somebody for something. Now, you know, like uh, she said that, you know, there's not a boogeyman hiding behind every IP address. However, because of the internet and because of the technology, technological world that we live in, access to information is very, very easy to get. Um, because of that, it's also easy to serve a counter narrative, just as easy as it is to serve a hateful narrative. So, you know, it kind of ways in both. But yes, people are recruiting, people are, there are sociopaths out there whose only goal in life is to try and get as many kids on their side as possible, no matter what their mission is, no matter what the, ideolo the ideology is, whether there is an ideology or not. I'll just give you an anecdote. Um, my, uh, my 10 year old, uh, he plays, you know, he's on online playing different kinds of video games. And he tells me about one of the things I always teach him. There's some basic messages that you can give them, especially if they're very young. So because of my work background, of course, I, I taught them early on that don't, don't ever give up information about your family, where they live, um, you know, details like that. And every once in a while, the younger ones need more reinforcement, right? Because they're, you know, they're, they're impulsive. They don't think long term, so they need it more. So I'm always telling him, like, he's online, he's playing, he's like, you know, he's, he's involved, he's in the moment. And I just say to him, like, okay, but you're not telling anyone anything, right? Because, and that's all I do. And then he tells me about his new friend who's 19 years old, who's, he's married, and he has a kid who's eight years old. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's, not, he's not thinking to do the math. He's thinking, I have a 19-year-old friend. All right? So, so I go on while he's chatting with his 19-year-old friend, and then I take the thing off, and I put it on. I'm like, hey, buddy. I'm like, it's, uh, it's Lookman's dad. Go silent. Hello? Go silent. I'm like, uh, don't make me come find you. <laughs> Click. And then my boy's like, hey, my friend's not calling me back anymore. Oh. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. I'm sure there are other friends you'll find. That's it. There are people out there, they might not be doing extremist recruiting, who you don't know what they're doing. You don't want to find out the hard way either. Forgive me, one small announcement out of respect to our Muslim participants. We have a prayer hall um, next door if anybody wants to go by and pray. It's just right across um, the hall this way. Thank you. Four minutes, I was told. Mubin, I didn't know Donald Trump saw you on 9-11 saying you were celebrating. Anyway, <laughs> I was not in New York at the time. Uh, 
Our speakers mentioned that the fear is one of the things which could cause you to tip over. I was going to ask that question, but he already did. Donald Trump and other people are causing fear in the community. I being a parent, a grandparent, my wife was, she wears hijab. She's a school teacher. She told me, she said, you know, when I go in the car, I'm really scared. People look at me, oh, this is a Muslim woman. My daughter told her, why don't you put on a baseball cap on top of your hijab? <laughs> the, the point is, this conversation did not take place in front of my grandchildren. But just imagine if we keep talking like this, the fear we hear on the TV, our political leader is very shameful though, and if our grandchildren listen to this, that fear is going to ingrain in them. And I'm worried about that part. I, I want to find out when those kids are going to be really afraid to be a Muslim in this country. In fact, I think this is part of this is part of the thing. So one of the things that ISIS itself had put out in print in their document, uh, Black Flags from Rome, they said that we are going to destroy the the gray zone of coexistence between people. And it will cause two things. One, it will cause Muslims to apostatize from Islam. And two, those that don't apostatize, they are forced to come and flee to us and join us. So it's a deliberate strategy on the part of ISIS anyway to create these divisions in society. Then you have these uh, the extremists on the other side, Donald Trump, etc., who they do the same thing. They they know that they they appeal to their base, and the base is about raw emotion, right? It's always who am I saving you from? I'm saving you from those Muslims. And my wife is a niqabi. She wears uh, my wife is Polish, convert, glow in the dark white. Okay, uh, I fear for her safety when she goes out. I don't want her to wear the veil. But I'm not going to tell her you can't wear the veil, take that off. That's her thing. But I fear for her safety. I encourage her to go and take one of the kids with her. And she's small. Right? And, and so, you know, what do we do? So the, really the only thing I know, it's, it's a very, we say in the Islamic terminology, is a time of fitna, of, of moral chaos and corruption. So it's very important for us to be stabilized. You stabilize yourself with spirituality, internally, and externally you do it through education. So you teach your kids. Yeah, you know, I teach my kids, I tell them what's happening. I had to tell them when I was uh, you know, an agent, you know, I had to tell them, look, a lot of people in the community don't like me because I had to put Muslims in jail. And they were bad Muslims, right? And, and I remind them that the duty of a Muslim is to stop another Muslim if he is doing wrong. I mean, this is clear. There's no difference of interpretation in Islam. But though, these are the kinds of things that I've had to have conversations with my own kids. And I mean, when they, I mean, my own kids are telling me about Donald Trump and what they're seeing on their own social networks. And this is the 14-year-old, the 12-year-old, and the 10-year-old is even, look, man, he's a 10-year-old. He's the one with the 19-year-old friend, he thinks. So you do need to have the conversations. And you know what? If, if it's about putting a hat on the hijab, do it. Whatever makes you feel safe, you do it. And always remember the last three digits of the pulse of the license plate, if ever you're, if anyone, you know. When I said sociopath recruiters, I didn't want to say Trump's name, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, assalamu alaikum. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Sayyid Naved, and I'm on the chair, I'm on the board of trustees of Islamic Center of Maryland which is the, one of the largest masjid in Montgomery County. It's in Gaithersburg here. I give you the background because the point that I'm going to bring forth is going to be quite important and relevant to that. Also, on a different note, I have served on the Maryland State Board of Education, so I'm coming from two perspectives over here. Just this morning, and uh, you know, Nauf had mentioned about that survey that was done, and a good portion of that survey that was conducted was at ICM Sunday School Children. This morning, we had an event at ICM. Which event, and that event was with boys and girls middle school who come to Sunday school at ICM. And that was attended by Dennis McDonough, who is the chief of staff of President Obama. And that focus of that was being a Muslim student in schools here in the US. Now, we are all aware Montgomery County is one of the most educated and 
liberal and rich county in this country. And here we have a serious problems in our school because a survey that was conducted and the feedback that the children gave in person to the chief of staff, the president today was, there are cases, there have been many cases where children are eating their food in the bathrooms because they are feeling scared in the cafeteria. They're being bullied. Uh, there are children who are being shoved into the lockers and so on and so forth, they're being bullied. Hijab being pulled down is somewhat, you know, minor, I would say, from that perspective. So the point that I am trying to bring forth over here, and maybe you can address, is that yes, it's important to focus on the Muslim children because they are being targeted and being recruited, but what is happening in the schools need to be addressed by our public school system. And that means our Montgomery County Public School System, Maryland State Department of Education, we need to work harder on preventing bullying because that's not just impacting Muslim children, there are cases of suicide that's occurring because of high school kids are getting bullied and so on. So I would like, you know, maybe the panel can address on that and maybe word because you're doing a fantastic job in this area, is to take on this and see what we can do working with a larger community to address this one problem of bullying which is impacting Muslims and non-Muslim children. It's a very, very important point and I apologize that we didn't mention the, the responses that came from uh, Islamic Center Maryland, but um, I'd like to commend Reverend Caseman on this issue because he's arranged with the superintendent and Larry Bowers and his entire executive staff to address this very issue. Um, and it really is such an important part, I think, of uh, addressing acculturation issues, those feelings of alienation, making sure that Muslim kids adapt well um, to their lives here in Montgomery County. And so it's an issue that I know Reverend Caseman has made um, the school system very aware of and to take very, very seriously. We would have had an audience with um, the superintendent had it not been for the snowstorm. So uh, Casey, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else in that respect. Thank you, we're in this together. Uh, we're also eager to uh, be hearing back. We're, on behalf of the county executive, uh, I convened a uh, summit off the record of uh, Muslim leaders. Uh, and since then, we've been pleased to uh, know that the imams have begun meeting uh, for the first time. We want to be reporting back to the county executive, but before then, it's important for us to be coming up with asks from the, commu uh, the Muslim community. So that's kind of where we are right now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike Rollins, friend of word, and uh, familiar with both the presenters, and I would, I'm not here to do a, a book plug, but I have, I have to tell you, having read both their books and met them previously, um, you just got a sample of what's in there. I would highly encourage you to read them. The, the stories are very worthwhile and very gripping. Uh, as someone who works with Hedia and others, and having served 30 years in the government and the FBI, now trying to figure out how to find those who are on the path and get them off the path, there are, as you might imagine, innumerable conversations of whose role is what and where does the government or others fit or not fit. And my question to each of you would be, as you were going down this path, you sort of alluded to it, what is it that could have been offered to you, if anything, to get you to change your mind and say no before you said yes? And just as importantly, who is it or who are those who could have made that offer that would have made a difference? Thanks, Mike. That's a really great question. Um, I think the, the best weapon against violent extremism is this room, is the community. Because, you know, law enforcement, their job is to arrest people and to investigate crimes. You know, academics and researchers, their job is, is to understand the evidence. The community's job is to be a community. And that means everybody in the community not just certain groups of people or, you know, not including the marginalized folks. De-radicalization or stopping extremism in general from radicalizing in general starts in the community. It starts with the parents. It starts with the schools. And to just address uh, the gentleman's uh, comment, where we're almost victim shaming people for being bullied. You know, they feel like they need to go eat in bathrooms or, you know, 
they're committing suicide, when in reality what we really need to do to fix the problem is to get to the source of the problem. And those are the people who are committing these acts, these bullies, these, the schools who aren't teaching empathy and, and uh, you know, parents who maybe aren't there for their children or don't, are so detached from who they are. So you know, my, my greatest advice is these are the people who really stop extremism from happening. What could have been in place um, besides ballerinas? I would have liked that. But, you know, as a 14 year old kid, you know, not unlike any other 14 year old kid, I wanted to matter. I really wanted to do something that mattered. So, had there been opportunity for me to do something that mattered, I would have gladly gone down that way. I didn't, you know, venture out into the world and say, you know, gosh, I wish I could be a racist someday. Um, you know, it was something that I learned because of the circumstances that I was in. Um, so, you know, opportunity, I, I live in Chicago and I live on the west side of Chicago and, and, you know, about six blocks from me is one of the most violent neighborhoods in the country. And it breaks my heart to know that kids from this neighborhood don't know or maybe have never been to Navy Pier, to Lake Michigan, which is a mile away from their house because they don't have the opportunity sometimes to leave those neighborhoods. Chicago is a very segregated city. And oftentimes public transportation doesn't even make it to some of these inner city neighborhoods. So there's no opportunity for job. There's no opportunity to meet people who are different so that you can learn empathy and learn compassion. So I, I think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I think it starts in the community. So the community can offer the greatest help to kids who are you know, going down that path. Like explain what that means. Is that like a loving adult? What, is sure. it like a trusting adult that lends a hand when they see a, a you know a troubled child right. or an emotional child? Well, Word has uh, probably one of the, the greatest intervention community intervention programs that I've seen, uh, and and I would only add one thing to that. So as far when I say community. You know, I mean teachers, I mean parents, I mean friends, I mean uh, faith leaders. Um, anybody who has access to help somebody else in the community. And I would also include formers, people who are like Mubin and I, who have been there, who you know, understand what got us into these groups and also what got us out of these groups. Because sometimes we're the only credible bridge builders. Because when I was 14 or when I was 16, I would never have talked to my teachers. I would never have talked to my parents about what I was thinking. I would never have talked to anybody but my friends or people that I trusted. And sometimes the only people that, kids who are being radicalized or who are already extremists, the only people that they trust are people who have also been radicalized. So a former, somebody who is, is you know, kind of a peer um, intervener is probably one of the greatest bridge builders to getting to mental health counseling or getting job training or getting you know, mentorship or anything like that. So I'll, I'll add. Yeah, just sorry, just I know you want to ask a question. Uh, for the brother first who asked the question about the schools, I think you, uh, another way to frame this is actually uh, bullying um, can lead to radicalization. Um, when you, if, if we all know this as parents, if you tell a kid, he's stupid, you're dumb, you're never going to amount to anything, you know, you're a bum, you're this, what do you think they're going to end up as? Well, so when Muslim kids are feeling that you're a terrorist, you're a terrorist, your religion is you know, garbage, this and that. What do you, what do you think? They're going to take on that, that rebellious identity, counter-identity. Uh, when he's talking about walking on the street and people would turn the other side, even in our story, when I came back and joined the, you know, the, the more extreme guys, now we would go as a gang. We would, like, five, six, ten of us would go to a school if we heard that a Muslim kid was being bullied. But we would show up and we would say, listen, we're terrorists. We will blow you up if you bother that kid. And people understood, okay. So, uh, I'm not saying you do that uh, to schools. <laughs> Point is, is that, that would be, that would be bad, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you, you want to frame it in that context. You, this is why you want to pay attention to that issue, because uh, you, you will push those kids into the willing arms, willing, waiting, open arms of those people who are saying, see, they hate you, you need to join us. We'll protect you. Uh, my friend, thank you very much for uh, for coming. Um, you know who who is you know who who is the intervener. Uh, of course, the debates on what is the role of each person. 
um, really, as Christian said, it's I think it comes down to two two categories. I keep pushing these categories: trusted intermediaries and subject matter experts. Sometimes you might have them both in the same person. Uh, could be a psychologist. Could be even a, it could be a local cop. You'd be surprised who people you know kids will talk to, right? Depending on what kind of um, uh, rapport you have and relationship building you have. But some of the things that could have been done, I know, look, we can list things. We can say, well, you know, when I was 19 and my community was saying, you're not good enough of a Muslim, somebody could have, you know, others could have said, no, 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 you're actually just fine. <laughs> you're like the rest of us, you're normal. I mean, there, there were things that could be done. But understand something. We live in a very, very complex society. We're dealing with now, uh, I mean, we're studying how technology is rewiring the human brain. Not just kids, adults. So, you know what? It's very possible that there's just nothing you can do. Sometimes. Sometimes they just have to go through that. You just have to do that. Uh, and trial by fire. Um, so you can't save them all. You can try to save them as much as you can. But understand, by the time they're in front of you and you're dealing with their issue, you don't know what the back end issue is, man. Like they could have been physically abused, sexually abused, uh, could be fetal alcohol, spell. it could be a whole bunch of things which will, by the time they get to you, how are you gonna fix that? Even, I mean, this is always asked of the police. The police are, you know, they're supposed to be everything. They're the 24 hour service, social service agency. They're the ones you can call at any time when there's a problem. And those, I mean, like, I feel sorry for cops sometimes because it's like, look, I didn't get it. Like, I was literally in Edmonton, uh, police service, uh, dealing with, like, the, the, the worst of the worst, quote unquote. And he's like, I would rather, his words, I would rather frame a house in, you know, freezing temperatures than, than do this social work -y stuff of that I'm being asked about to do. And they're not even trained to do that. So... Uh, so, I mean, just I'm trying to illustrate the whole context in which we need to start thinking about some things. We can't give all the answers here, but... Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for this great presentation. Now you're going to make me excited uh, to go watch my 15 grandkids who are sitting on the computer and know all day long. So they're going to be bombed here. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I just wanted to make a comment about the hijab uh, thing. Uh, I never really, when people said, aren't you afraid being wearing this hijab and all that? I said, oh, no, no, I don't care. I mean, you know. So till one day, I was at the gas station and putting my gas on, and there was this guy sitting in his truck, and he looked at me saying, hey, you, Lady Isis. And I said, okay, what's this guy want now? So I just, you know, mind my own business, and he said, I'm talking to you, Lady Isis. And I said, this guy want to have a conversation. So they just go fight him. And I said, I looked at him, sir, are you talking to me? He said, yes, you're from ISIS, right? I said, who are you talking about? Who's ISIS? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, here is my business card. When you find out who's ISIS, call me and let me know. So sometimes when you really make them feel that they're ignorant and ignorance is not gonna get you anywhere, they kind of said, well, what is ISIS really? So that's, that's, that's as far as wearing the hijab. I find it funny, but it, it did work. You drove away, you didn't care. So, uh, so use that technique. The other thing about the community, you mentioned the community, and I wanna just say something about uh, the community. I, can, I immigrated here uh, 45 years ago. I'm originally from Egypt. Uh, I have three children and 15 grandchildren. So uh, when I came here and people used to say community, and I look at them, what is community? What are you talking about? Community to me is my mom, my dad, my uncle, my sister, my brother. So it is my immediate family. So the word community here means your, your community, your PTA, your uh, chamber of commerce, your all those associations and organizations, that is your community. So what I'm trying to say by that is get involved in your community. I'm talking now to my fellow here, you know, my friends here uh, who are from, you know, the Muslim community. Uh, because you, I can't tell you how much I had changed people's mind by getting involved with my PTA, by getting involved with uh, churches, uh, by get, by, I always say education is your passport into integration. So if we want to integrate, we must educate. And I'll end with that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. 
Uh, as always happens to me when I go to these kind of meetings, I'm the only Latina around. <laughs> I'm so sorry, but other people are not interested in discovering and exploring all the, the wealth and the richness we have in our county. But um, what the, the experience that Mimi um, said um, remind me of what my hairdresser told me, Latina, also from Colombia. I asked her, what do you think about the people, immigrants from Syria, do you want them coming around or not? She said, oh, no, 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 because they're coming to kill us. So, and uh, I told her, no, wait a minute, think about it. Think about, you came from Colombia because you were living in poverty, and these guys are also suffering like you were. We need to help them in the same way that you got help. Um, but what I, I want to say is that that's what is going on in the Latino community. And how can we change those minds? I explained to her their situation in Syria, but I'm still not sure <coughs> that my explanation made any change in her opinion and her feelings. And, and think about, and I think about all Latinos com making comments at home and their children listening to that kind of comment, going to school and seeing uh, their friends, Muslim friends. Just think about a kid who doesn't have any uh, way to defend themselves. Uh, they, they can think different from their parents because their parents are the role model. So how can we as a community make them change their minds? How can I as a Latina change my friends? points of view, so they don't influence their kids. Because I know Mimi, I know a, a lot of um, people from uh, Muslims, and they are beautiful people. They are loving people. They are caring people. I really wish we could all come together and, and explore and, and not fear the others, and, and embrace the other, and, and talk to the other. And um, I'm, I'm really open to to, to gather my Latino community, my Latino leaders, and do something, because we have to do something. This is not the truth. Children are not learning the truth. And there is a lot of fear in our community, and we have to stop that. I have a, I have a solution for you. Um, <laughs> videos uh, on YouTube uh, on Syria uh, and the refugees. Uh, whether it's in Spanish, um, I think most of them understand English. Very short videos. Uh, there, there's so many of them online. You can go on and find them. They're very easy to find, uh, to explain. And just tell them, you know what? Don't listen to me. Just watch that video. They, what they see with their own eyes and hear from the volume and like the audio of the video will affect them more than just you telling them. I, I've tried this. I've done this. And I've said, uh, uh, I mean, don't believe me. Don't listen to me. Just, just watch that video. You know, they, they watch uh, Latino news, and if you see Latino news... Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I've seen Latino news. It's like, like Fox News, basically. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, don't, don't, yeah, exactly. YouTube. Say, so, you know what? Just watch this video. And even if they try to... All you gotta do is get them to watch the video. It's just like reverse ISIS. <laughs> all you gotta do is get them to watch the video. You can say this, you can, and you can... I, this is what happened to me. The person was arguing this and that. I was like, look, we can argue all day long. You can tell me you think this, I'm gonna tell you I think this. Just watch that video, I, I challenge you. It's gonna take you two minutes. What they see in that two minutes, they will never forget. <clears throat> Promise me. I, I would just add to that, uh, what the woman said, you know, education really is the problem solver because, you know, we're scared of what we don't understand. So when the media is, you know, is giving all this kind of misinformation and, and it's confusing people, hate comes from fear of not knowing something. So when I see a snake, I hate snakes. I hate snakes. So when I see a snake, I want to kill it, right? I don't understand snakes. I don't, uh, you know, I don't know what's poisonous, what's not. But there are people who handle snakes and they're, you know, snake whatever. And they're not scared of snakes because they understand them. So they don't fear them. So for me, you know, it, ignorance really comes from fear. And fear and ignorance manifest as hate, and hate manifests as violence. So I think education, you were very right, education really is the big problem solver. If we all got to know each other on a personal level, I suspect it would be hard for us to hate each other. One more 
Okay. So, uh, just one second. Um, I'm organizing the New Americans Expo, uh, and every year we're going to do that in October 23rd, and we are um, giving six hours of the New Americans Expo in uh, a conference room for people to talk about Muslim culture, Muslim religion, Muslim dances, Muslim, <coughs> Muslim everything Muslim, so we can understand what Muslim is. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Saida Hantati, and I actually work in Montgomery County Public School. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit of what I do, and I think I might respond to some of the questions that you have here, and I have some questions for you, if you don't mind. Uh, my job is really, it's called Peace All Parent Community Coordinator. So my job is to link the community with the school and with the parents. Um, the way I do, I do that, I'm part of the team, and for now we are in the division of ESOL, and what we do is we go to different schools. So because I do speak Arabic, I speak French too, I have access to a lot of students who are Muslim in the community, who just arrived or who have a language barrier. And most importantly, I have access to the parents. So I would say, when the family comes into our school, I would get like a, a referral from the school if there's a problem or if they just arrived. And my job is to link this family to the community. Um, I'm here, I've been here for the last uh, two years. I've been coming regularly to the ICC and the reason I do that is because it is one of the greatest resources I have in this county. Um, before that, I've been working for MCPS for 11 years now, before that, we didn't have that many, I would say, challenges with the Muslim community. Uh, I have now, we have, you know, we have a search, we have people coming, refugees, and Nuf and I work together all the time, so we have refugees coming from Iraq, we have, we have Egyptian people coming, we have, we have a lot of students coming from the Middle East, but not only the Middle East, African countries too. And what we do is, what I do is I collaborate <coughs> with the community. So that would be an answer from what we do in the school system. I think the system, the school system is changing the same way the community is changing. And I am, I'm here today to say thank you to the ICC because it makes my job easier to be able to link families to this community. Now we'll go to this side. Oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Sheikh, um, how do we find the right videos? Or do you have some names of videos? You just said, yep. yeah, there's. Um, <coughs> Oh, I can't remember what it's, uh, you'd have to kind of Google search this one. This one is, uh, it's basically a white girl with a birthday cake. Uh, I think some of you have seen it. it. I think it was made by the British. And it was, it's like one minute of Syria. A Syria in one minute. Uh, if you were to do, I, I should, you know what, I, I don't want to give you the terms. I should, uh, if I can get your email or something, I will find the videos for you. I just give you a handful of them, three or four or five. Yeah. They're very short. And, I mean, talking about a thousand words, it's just, it's mind-blowing. And, like I said, I'll, I will get them to you. Um, yeah, they're, they're short, they're right to the point, and they will educate people very quickly as to what's going on. I want to, sorry, if I could just quickly, uh, on the education point, I was, because I was, um, because I know <clears throat> some of our uh, co-religionists are here, I think it's very important for um, the interfaith approach. Uh, it's very, very important. Uh, whether it's to partner up uh, Muslim kids with Christian kids with Jewish kids and have all of them support each other. Uh, I always say, you know, one God, one love. And let them feel that they are a part of a greater community. It's not just Muslims by themselves. Uh, and especially in a time, in a day and age where religion itself is under attack and the belief in God is under attack. I think enlarging that community uh, enlarging the community for that Muslim to feel that they're a part of will be will be also quite helpful. So, I'm just 
ask one more question because I know people are trying to like get out and things, so I wanted to give people a chance to come and talk to our speakers and get food and... and I'm smelling the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and please do not leave without taking some chicken. There's 300 pieces of chicken and you have to take chicken. <laughs> if you're a vegetarian, give it to your friends. But <laughs> one well, last housekeeping, we will have autograph books by our, um, by our speakers today, so please um, come in and, and buy books. What happened when you went to the Muslim event? They, they killed us against our will and gave us chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Well, I wanted to say thank you for sharing your narratives. They're both quite incredible. Um, before everyone gets going, I really wanted to touch on this issue of identity that seems to be quite prevalent. Um, Ms. Nufi spoke of what ICC does and how you guys essentially embrace these integrated um, identities and how important that is, especially when dealing with the youth. Gentlemen, I was kind of wondering from your personal experiences, uh, what, as having gone through this journey of going through an identity crisis and then kind of reconstructing this identity and then having that deconstructed and then, you know, coming to where you are today, what resources did you find to be the most helpful um, personally? And um, I look to take it up a little further more. Um, you both spoke of like working together previously. You mentioned Dublin, fascinating country, and Ireland, and all of that stuff. Um, what have been your biggest challenges working on this circuit in terms of building legitimacy? Okay. <laughs> in thirty seconds. In thirty seconds. Um, my family was my best resource for me. So the people who despite what I, all the evil stuff that I had done, who stuck by me and uh, realized that that was you know, a misguided uh, part of my life and not who I really was, um, and that they stuck by me. That was my biggest resource and my children. I, I became a dad. So I now had something to love uh, instead of something to fear. And um, that was, those two things were probably the, the two most important uh, resources or or um, tools that I had to you know to foster me through the change and if it wasn't for that I don't know that anybody else would have given me the chance um, the legit what was the second question so the credibility on the circuit for many many years I've been do, I've been doing this work for 20 years I've planted so many seeds uh, during those seven years of hate that I've, I've kind of seen myself for the last 20 years as this gardener who's just constantly pulling weeds from all those seeds that were scattered years ago from the work that I did. Um, so the, big, the biggest hurdle that I faced over the last 20 years was, um, cre was credibility, mm -hmm. uh, specifically with law enforcement and the government. Um, because they didn't really want to take the time, first of all, for some reason, domestic white extremism doesn't seem to be a top priority for them, even though it should be. Um, so for me, they didn't really care to talk to me because they just saw me as somebody who was broken and had been through something. Um, and it took a long, long time of me doing work and helping people for them to finally say, oh, you really are what you say you are kind of thing. Um, and uh, so th that for me has been the biggest hurdle. Funding is always a big problem. It's a little bit easier now because uh, you know violent extremism seems to be um, kind of a hot button issue, and, and they seem to be a little bit looser with their with their pocketbooks. But uh, you know, they're really I mean, we're just now starting to to connect all these dots between organizations like Word and with Life After Hate, and with you know all the organizations that we work with. Everybody was kind of off doing their own thing and nobody knew about anybody else. Uh, and the one great thing about Dublin was that it brought all of us together for the first time, most of which didn't know each other. And now we're, you know, a great family. We still work together, we still talk to each other. You know, now, you know, it's so funny because I'm glad I didn't bring my PowerPoint because had I brought it, it would have been exactly like movies, exactly. Like the videos and the rhetoric and the recruiting tactics were all exactly the same, so. I think, yeah, I'm gonna totally segue off of that. Uh, I went to Dublin and they, they brought four uh, categories of violent extremists, ultra-nationalists, white supremacists, religiously motivated, and urban street gangs. And compared and contrasted, and on the panel, they would put one person from each group and they would ask the question, how did you get in? What kept you in? What got you out? Uh, before I got there, I thought I was the only one. I was 
dejected, I was depressed, I thought, oh my God. I went to Dublin, I met a family uh, of, of, oh man, it was, I mean, and I just got invigorated, uh, like, to the nth degree after that. People don't realize, like, what that did. It was like, okay, now it's like, boot up, lace up, let's go. Um, so to your questions directly, um, what got me, I mean, look, I struggled. It was not easy. It was not easy. I cried, I bled. Uh, I had moments of doubt. I lost my faith. I got it back. I lost it. I got it back. I was in disarray, complete chaos. But it's it's pulling order out of chaos. That that's that really. It's okay. This is really crazy. Uh, I, I I started skydiving. I felt that I mean I just I went, I got to a point where there was just so much chaos in my life. I thought you know what because I wanted to kill myself. I said all right, throw yourself out of a plane. <laughs> And there's a saying, right? Why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Well, the skydivers have, skydivers have a shirt. It says, why not? The door was open. <laughs> and, and because you have a parachute, right? And then I remember it's just, it's how I, it's you personally, right? Like, I, by the grace of God, I have a good family. My parents, you know, um, I got married, of course. I have a good education. I was able to rely on my own um, effort. And it was only when I was sitting in the plane and the door opened up and the wind rushes in and you see the sights and this and that, that's when you need that focus. And so I threw myself out of the plane. And it was, uh, so that's, that's kind of how I, it took time, it's a chaotic, especially when it's a very new topic, nobody really knows what's going on. And so now into the second part of your question about how do you, you know, struggle with the credibility, I guess. I mean, I'm in a more difficult situation, I think, uh, especially in the Muslim community, um, because I was an undercover. And, uh, I understand, you know, the Muslim community is under siege. Uh, they feel under siege, rightfully so, I think. Um, you have also some not so ethical tactics uh, that certain government agencies are using. Um, there's a place for all of that. There's a place for criticizing all of that. Uh, and remember, it's also new for the agencies. They also don't, there's nothing in the books to tell you how to deal with this stuff. You want me to start talking to a 15-year-old kid about how, like, he shouldn't be radicalized? What the hell does radicalized mean? You know, back in my day, right? This is how we think. So, uh, so for me, um, there are still some segments in the community that consider me, you know, a sellout uh, uh, or whatever it is. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you, the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. um, I have stopped kids from joining ISIS. I have prevented girls from becoming jihadi brides. What have you done? Is what I say to those people who whatever. So, uh, just keep at it. Keep at it. Keep at it. And um, it's, uh, again, I, I want to reinforce this point. It's very important to, if you're gonna do any kind of quote unquote CVE thing, you don't wanna make it just about Muslims. That's why I'm very happy. I'm very happy that Christian is here. Because people need to understand, because while I'm listening to him, I'm like, there's my story, yeah, okay, I, I know that, yep, yeah. oh, okay, there we go again, identity, this and that, looking for kids who don't. It's exactly the same. And it's because it's been made this exotic other that we think, yeah, we, we have to look at it, we have to stare at it, basically, right? Some foreigner that's come from, oh, ISIS, yeah, ISIS videos, yeah, yeah, yeah. But once people realize, like he said, once you, once you realize that, wait a second, they're actually quite normal and it's actually a very normal process and anyone can go through it, oh, okay, it's not so scary anymore. So. At 17 years old, I tried to fly to South Africa to join uh, the AWB to join the apartheid. So our, I don't think we've ever talked about that, but our lives are very, very similar. It's almost scary. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll both be in the back there if anybody would like.